We're talking about the destruction of our society. Oh my goodness, things are bad. Rising sea levels, drought. Climatic changes, ozone depletion, and other global environmental problems have emerged as threats to our very survival. It always ends in mass death. Even if we survive, our nation is in decline. A problem that's unprecedented in our history. People will lose their jobs. And one day the system breaks. Simply put, we're in trouble. But wait, might we invent our way out of trouble? We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. So many good things are happening. I just can't believe that. I made it. This woman just heard sound for the first time. Did you hear those words? <laughs> the Good New Days. That's our show tonight. John Stossel. He worried about the future? It's hard not to be if you watch the news. It's mostly negative. Violence, disasters, danger, and I suppose that's our job to tell you about problems. If the plane crashes, that's news. The fact that thousands of planes will land and take off safely during this TV program is a miracle. But it's not news. So we soak in disasters and heed warnings about the next one. Bird flu is going to kill us. Global warming. Pesticide residues. I've covered hundreds of scares and finally I wised up and tried to put things in perspective. In England, a journalist smarter than I was quicker to realize he'd been focusing on the wrong things. It led to this book, The Rational Optimist. Matt Ridley now gives lectures around the world explaining why he's an optimist. You went into this assuming things were getting worse. Back in the 1970s, the future was bleak. You know, the population explosion was unstoppable, famine was inevitable, pesticides were going to shorten our lives, bird flu was going to kill us, the ice age was coming back, uh, acid rain was killing forests, all these, the desert was advancing, uh, the Y2K <laughs> computer bug, all these things were going to go wrong. And that's what everybody said to me about the future. And so I was kind of surprised when I grew up to find that actually things had been getting better, much better for most people most of the time. Some people call this pessimism porn or fear porn. It sells in the media. People want to be scared. And it sounds kind of wiser to talk about what might go wrong than to talk about what might go right. It, it, it's, it seems kind of foolish to talk about what might go right. Uh, so on the whole, there's much more market for bad news than good news. And you mentioned overpopulation. When I was in college, that was the scare that they were selling me. Uh, the, the book the population bomb was a bestseller. Uh, the author warned that the 1980s would bring mass starvation because population growth uh, would have outrun the food supply. And the population did double. Uh, he said there'd be mass starvation by the 80s. The 80s came and went without a shortage of food. Yet some in the media continue to shriek about unsustainable population growth. There are now 7 billion people on Earth. If we do nothing, it'll go up to nine. And at some point, there's not going to be enough stuff for everybody. Really? And here's another wrinkle. Since global warming's now the hyped scare of the moment... Should mandatory population control become a part of the fight against global warming? Mandatory population control. So how would that work? A government official would come to your house, Matt, and forcibly tie our tubes? Well, that's roughly what happened in China for the last 30 years. There has been mandatory population control. It's been extraordinarily cruel and with a huge amount of suffering involved. Uh, and it's unnecessary because it turns out that population growth rates have been falling all around the world, whether you've had mandatory or voluntary control. Because all you have to do is give people a bit more prosperity, a bit more wealth, a bit more education. Uh, and it turns out that if their kids stop dying, they have fewer kids. These days, the media are hyping crime and terrorism, and there is a reason to be fearful. Almost 3,000 people did die on September 11th, and there have been mass shootings, often in schools. The, the head of the NRA recently said, this is why we need guns. There are terrorists, home invaders, drug cartels, carjackers, knockout gamers, rapers, haters, campus killers, airport killers, 
he goes on and on, and those things have happened, and there are good reasons why people should be allowed to have guns, but it upsets me to see the head of the NRA hyping this stuff. Crime is declining, violence is declining all around the world to an extraordinary extent. I mean, the, 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 the number of rapes, the number of murders, you know, are going down steadily in countries like the United States. And uh, the number of people killed in warfare uh, globally was the lowest in the last decade of any decade since records began. Um, that may not feel like it to us in the West because of Iraq and Afghanistan, but it was true globally that we, we are seeing much less violence around the world. And yet, if you survey people and ask them if that's true, I would think most just would not believe that. Because uh, we were constantly being told about the violence that's happening and not told about the gradual trend towards less violence of all kinds. Finally, Matt, ma many people still envy the life royalty once lived. Oh, to be a king in the good old days. And yet, you made a video for your book pointing out that today, most of us live better than kings once did, even though the kings had hundreds of servants. Consider Louis XIV, the Sun King. Louis chose from 40 dishes every night, taking 498 people to prepare each meal. Today's average person can go into a supermarket and buy a fresh, frozen, tinned, smoked or pre-prepared meal made with beef, chicken, pork, lamb, fish, eggs, potatoes, beans, carrots, or he can choose to eat from scores of nearby restaurants, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, or Indian, each of which has a team of skilled chefs waiting to serve at less than an hour's notice. Add all this up and you realize that you have far more than 498 servants at your beck and call. We've effectively got thousands and thousands of people working for us. That's what the, the system of commerce is. It's a collaborative, cooperative system. Thank you, Matt Ridley. Here's another reason that the good old days were not as good as today. Most everything is smaller, faster, lighter, denser, cheaper. That's the title of Robert Bryce's new book. What do you mean smaller, faster, lighter, and so on? Well, John, look at, uh, I carry a cell phone in my pocket, a smartphone. It has 250,000 times more digital storage capacity than the computer that went to the moon. The other day I bought an iPod Nano, holds th as much music as 300 LPs. On an efficiency basis, it's 2,000 times lighter and 6,000 times more efficient by volume than an LP. The progress haters take this and say, and so we're overwhelmed with choice. This isn't, doesn't make our lives better. Sorry, overwhelmed with choice? Yeah, I, I don't use with... most of the stuff on my <laughs> cell phone. It's too complicated. Fair enough, but let's look beyond that. Let's look at, at smaller computers. Let's look at faster communications, denser engines, denser agriculture. All of these things have allowed uh, increasing living, living standards all over the world. I like a line from your book. All this may be true, but some people aren't happy unless they're scared and miserable. Well, what sure. do you mean? Well, sure. Uh, no politician ever got elected, John, by saying everything's going to be okay. Right? The devil is at the door. We, you have to elect me, and if you don't elect me, then certainly ruination will come. So this is part of the, uh, you know, the media. If it bleeds, it leads. Uh, that, that is something that we see all the time. Um, and yet this continuing increase in living standards all over the world has been truly remarkable. Now, I'm old and all my life I've heard, we're going to run out of oil. Almost 40 years ago, my president told me we had to have an unpleasant talk about the energy crisis. This is the greatest challenge that our country will face during our lifetime. The energy crisis has not yet overwhelmed us, but it will if we do not act quickly. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. A rapidly shrinking resource. Isn't that remarkable? You know, if you look back... Well, it's logical, yeah. It's, we're, we're using stuff, so the resources must be shrinking. Sure, but what's happening? Better drill rigs, better drill bits, better seismic technology. Their new technologies are allowing effectively computer sensors at the edge of the drill bit. So let's look at back at history. 2005, Lee Raymond, the chairman of ExxonMobil, said natural gas production has peaked in North America. What's happened? Natural gas production today in the U.S. is 41 percent higher than it was in 2005. And the U.S. now is producing so much natural gas, we're looking at exporting natural gas. On page 180 of your book, I like the list, in 1914, the U.S. Bureau of Mines said well, oil supplies would be depleted within 10 years. Sure. 
So in 20 years, we still have oil. Department of Interior says they'll be gone in 13 years. In 1946, maybe we have 20 years left, says the State Department. The Department of Interior again in 1951 depleted, they like the 13 year number. Of course, and, and yet what's happened, just January of this year, 2014, the U.S. exported, I repeat, U.S. exported an average of four million barrels of oil a day, almost all of it in the form of gasoline and refined products. The reality is the more oil and gas we find, the more oil and gas we find. All right, you're cherry picking oil and gas. We're going to run out of other stuff, maybe food. John Boyce, who's a, an economist at the uh, University of Calgary, and he looked at prices of industrial commodities over more than a hundred years. And what did he find? For the overwhelming majority of them, they fell in price. It's and if it falls in price, that means there's more of it. And that's why it falls in the price. The combination of price and innovation is a remarkably powerful combination. And that's what we've seen. The effort towards smaller, faster, lighter, denser, cheaper is happening all around us. But given that we've seen it, why can't we see it? Wow. That's a good question. I think part of it is that, again, there, there is a tendency to want to be pessimistic as we look forward. Today, we have 3D printing and ever faster communications, ever cheaper commun uh, computers. All of these things, at cheap or even free education now, thanks to online courses. And information that's free now all over the world. And cheaper energy, which is the foundation of modern society. You add all of these things together, and I think we are poised, particularly here in the, in the U.S., for another American century because we have all of these things in spades that other countries lack. And we will get more into that during this show. Thank you, Robert Bryce. Thank you. To keep this conversation going at Facebook or Twitter, you can use that hashtag, good news. Let people know what you think. So coming up, murder, war, miserable poverty. It does persist, and yet I'll tell you why these are the good new days. Are you poor? What does it mean to be poor in America these days? Around the world, about 300 million people struggle to live on a dollar a day or less. 300 million people, that's equal to America's entire population. And this is a terrible thing. And yet, it's really good news. It's the good new days because 300 million very poor people is a smaller portion of the world than ever before. This chart shows the percentage of people living on less than a dollar a day. Now it's 5% of the world. But when I graduated college, it was 25%. Millions have lifted themselves out of poverty. And it's great to read on the website Think Progress articles like five reasons why 2013 was the best year in human history. Fewer people are dying, dying young, and more live longer. Fewer people suffer from extreme poverty, and the world's getting happier. But wait a second, Think Progress is this lefty website. These are big government liberals who are generally clueless about economic progress, who wrote those sensible articles. Who wrote it? Well, actually, Zach Beecham. And not only do you realize that life got better, but you say it's largely because of free markets. Yeah, markets are a big part of the story. And the reason that they are is because they spark innovation. So way back in the 17th century, people started to develop ideas about science and reason and research. And that led to the development of new medicines and sciences that led to great remedies for the diseases that had killed millions and millions of people young earlier. Markets are one really important way that we distributed those diseases and you know, got the benefits of those uh, remedies for the diseases uh, to a large number of people around the world. Saved millions of lives. Because somebody wanted to make a profit curing people. In part, yeah. Markets and governments worked in tandem to produce these outcomes and distribute them to people who needed them, poorer people and wealthier people alike. So. It's so obvious to me, and you got it. Why didn't your colleagues at Think Progress well, get it? Well, they do. Modern liberals and conservatives broadly agree that markets are good, that we should have market systems that well, are well, communists. I'm looking at, you've left Think Progress, but on the site, nine reasons why 2013 was not the best year in history. School closings, shutting the doors on black and Hispanic students. College grads can't buy houses. The gender wage gap. Women are being murdered at work. I mean, this is a 
different worldview. Well, there are lots of things that are still bad, and the fact that the world has gotten much better is not a reason to be complacent about the things that are still terrible. Global climate change, first among them, I think, climate change being catastrophic and dangerous. Now, set that aside for the minute, we should celebrate the progress that we've made because it's the greatest accomplishment in the past 200 years of human history. And we shouldn't attack the free markets that brought us much of that progress. No, we should talk about regulating free markets in a way that's sensible and can make this progress better and deal with the problems that we still have, including environmental ones. Regulating them. We don't already have enough or too much of that? No, I don't think so. And the reason we don't is that right now, a lot of the benefits of growth in the way that they used to be aren't being distributed appropriately. Right? People aren't getting welfare maximizing. You know, we're talking about human welfare, people's lives getting better and them getting richer. Right now, poor people around the world could be doing much better than they are, even though, again, they're doing much better than they used to be. Governments could really help with that process. So how's that working out in Cuba and the former Soviet Union? You know, there's space between Cuba and Sweden, for but example. But that's, okay, so Sweden's worked it out. The Nordic countries do the best in the world. They rate themselves as happy, but uh, that's because they're Swedes and you're, they're polite. You ask them in these no, surveys, actually, are you happy? This and is a point that you'll like. The wealthier countries get per capita, the happier they are too. And because these countries are wealthier per capita, they tend to be happier as time goes on. But they don't invent anything. Well, the inventions are part of the global market, right? And yeah, we invent. It's not just us. They invent some things, right? Like, for instance, Estonia invented Skype. But Estonia is a free market country. Right. It's also what's a country Sweden, that's some regulations. What's Sweden done since Volvo? Um, lots of things that have made people's lives better inside that country. For instance, tax money and giving it to people who need it. Why this hostility to markets? It's not a hostility to the idea of markets. There is no hostility towards markets. It's hostility towards under-regulated markets. And under-regulated markets are And that's arguably, what we've got with our piles and piles of regulation? Yeah, because they're not giving enough to the people who need things. There are still people who are suffering in immense amounts. There's still a great deal of discrimination against women and against minorities. And more regulation won't kill the golden goose? No, it won't. For instance, global life expectancy was 47 in 1950. 50. Since then, it's gone up to 70. That's been, and life expectancy. Not because improved. of regulation. Yeah, in part it has, right? Take a decline in crime globally, right? Innovation, like, I say. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Zach. You <laughs> won't solve this here. No. Coming up, something that poisons your drinking water and the air we breathe and causes global warming. Well, that's what I hear, but I look at the same thing and see mostly good news. That's next. The controversy is over chemicals being injected into the earth to break up rock and release natural gas. It's called fracking, and it scares people. It might pollute my drinking water. They use dangerous chemicals. They might spill them. So fracking is banned many places, including in this state, my state. Anne McElhenney grew up in Ireland, where she was a dutiful left-wing environmentalist, so he must be against this dangerous way of sucking gas and oil out of the ground. Not even slightly. Um, no, I think it's a marvelous thing, because I think energy is really important. Without energy, life ceases to exist. We need more of it, not less of it. What, what brought you around? Uh, the truth actually brought me around um, and I sort of discovered that a lot of the environmentalists who are scaring us to death with, uh, with nonsense about fracking are making stuff up. You make fracking sound good. Here's a video about one of the dangers. They take good water, mix it up with not so good stuff, and shoot it into the wells to force out the gas. A tear finds a way into the lining of a waste pit. Poisonous vapors find a way into your lungs. And cancer-causing chemicals find a way into your glass. Poisonous vapors and cancer-causing chemicals. They do use them. Unbelievable. So the fracking fluid has carcinogens in it, but absolutely everything is. If you're worried about fracking fluid, you should really worry about coffee. There's carcinogens in absolutely everything. And, and this video... And I know this is, this is hard to accept, but and it was hard for me too, but it's true. At, at big doses in broccoli and coffee, 
there are carcinogens. Correct, absolutely. But if we're more scared of these chemicals. Yeah, I mean, we're scared of everything. I mean, there's, there's one of the poshest hotels in California has a big sign on it saying there's carcinogens in here. There's carcinogens in there yet, but it matters the quantity of whatever the carcinogen is. And if that's the only thing that you ever eat every day, all of your life, then you're in trouble. The amount, it's minuscule, the amount of, carcin of, this, of these chemicals that are in the fracking fluid. It's complete nonsense. An anti-fracking movie won an Oscar nomination, telling viewers scary things like, if we allow fracking, your tap water may catch fire. But as I reported before, there are many places in America where no fracking is done, but water still catches fire. This is a lake in Alaska. This man lives in New York where fracking is banned, yet... Whoa. So why does the water catch fire? Oh, lucky, lucky people. Do check and see if your water's flammable. If it is, lucky, lucky you. Why? It means there's so much hydrocarbons out there. If your water is flammable, lucky, lucky you. Because lucky, you can make you. money off of a it. A lot of money. And a lot of money. <laughs> why in America have people figured this out, but not in other countries? The, the natural gas drop in price, boom in supply, Mostly America. It's not because we necessarily have more of it. No. America is, is unique in so many ways. This is an extraordinary country, but there's something absolutely unique to America that doesn't happen anywhere else, where individuals own mineral rights, and it's a game changer. The oil and gas company go directly to your door, and wouldn't you be so happy, John, if someone knocked on your door and said, you know something, John, we'd like to give you a million dollars today, and we're going to give you a royalty check every month that will come with regularity. And if you have a nice piece of hydrocarbon under your building, that check will come for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. And it's my money, It's my, I have a deed to my property, Correct. I own it. In yes. Ireland, the government would Correct. own it. And in, and in England, it's the Queen that owns it. So, it's so people, big... when they knock, they say, no, go away. Well, why should they bother? I actually think, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of with them. Why should they bother? Because they're not going to benefit. Here in America, the people benefit. And you can see that more, no more so than in, in North Dakota, where this has been a game changer for people. And back to an earlier point, energy is important. Let's put the slide light up of the woman in Africa. I mean, this has been life for people forever. The washing machine has liberated women more than the pill. The truth is that this woman should be either having a cocktail or finding a cure for cancer. And instead of that, she's doing this back-breaking, mindless, rubbish of a job that's been almost that, all day almost all day for many days by the way anyone who's traveled in india or africa see women wasting their lives when they could be have, playing tennis as i said or finding a cure for a terrible disease or just having a nice time and instead of that, they're wasting their time doing this energy really matters that's the least of it by the way so when they say more regulation let's be safe rather than sorry we'll delay it a bit be sure we're condemning people like her to a life of drudgery. And by the way, we're living in an incredibly regulated world here. The regulations already in existence at a state level to, to regulate oil and natural gas production is almost obscene already. So I think this idea that it needs even further regulation, nonsense, and the idea that we would stop women like that from having what we have, well, I just think it's, a, it's an appalling thing to do. Thank you, Ann McEnany. Coming up, more reasons why these are the good new days. This woman is hearing sound for the first time. September, October, <laughs> November, <laughs> December. <laughs> Could you hear those words? <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> Can you hear my voice coming through both sides? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that woman's hearing sounds for the first time because she just got cochlear implants. What a difference technology can make. <laughs> Could you hear those words? <laughs> Makes me cry just watching. And there's more that could make us cry if we knew about it. Forty years ago, man-made body parts were a fantasy in TV shows like the Six Million Dollar Man. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man better, stronger, faster. 
fiction then, and the actor, Lee Majors, did actually age. Here he is more recently. Most of you remember me as the $6 million man. Those physical abilities were enhanced by bionic technology. Well, now I'm here to introduce the Lee Majors Bionic Rechargeable Hearing Aid. Selling hearing aids. Well, Dr. Kevin Campbell grew up watching The Six Million Dollar Man and says the world's caught up to the TV show. Really? Absolutely. It is amazing. The time we live in now is one of the most exciting times in history for science and technology and medicine. We're able to provide things for patients that we've never imagined would be true, like on The Six Million Dollar Man. And one of the biggest new things is the 3D printer. And I get how they can make a gun or other non-living things, but the next thing is replacing organs? Printing organs? <laughs> Exactly. It's amazing technology. It uses the same technology as a, an inkjet printer, but instead of ink, we have a matrix of, matrix of stem cells and other organic compounds, and the computer generates this three-dimensional image that's a living organ. This could solve so many problems in medicine with organ shortages for heart transplants, kidney transplants, and the like. This has even been accomplished already in children born without a windpipe. And there's been successful three-dimensional printed tracheas that are implanted in these children. These children are doing well now. We'll be able to serve patients who normally may die waiting on a transplant list. Which is about 18 people a day, most of them waiting for kidneys. That's exactly right. And uh, Wake Forest, where you went to school, uh, researchers figured out how to print new skin cells onto burn wounds using 3D printers. What squirts out instead of ink are different kinds of skin cells. They only need a patch of skin a tenth the size of the burn to grow enough skin cells to print skin. Before, burn victims would have to have skin grafts, and these would be large surgeries where your own skin was harvested from other locations in your body. So then you have multiple wounds that are at risk for infection. If we can print skin to cover these burn victims, I think that plastic surgery and burn type medicine is really going to leap forward. Let's move on to other bionic body parts. This teenager was born with an arm that doesn't extend beyond her elbow. A charity got a company to give her an artificial arm and surprised her with the news in this auditorium. And they've been generous enough to actually give you a bionic arm. <laughs> This is what she has always wanted her whole life. She always wanted to get a bionic hand. Now she's opened up a whole new world for her. And that was her father speaking. And these artificial arms, hands, knees keep getting better. They really do. The technology is amazing. Now we can control these body parts with thoughts, just like when you think, I want to move my arm, it happens. The way the surgeons maintain this is the nerves in the shoulder still exist and they still can receive signals from the brain. They then connect these nerves to a muscle group in the chest that allows the chest muscles to respond to your thoughts. Then an electrode goes from your chest to the mechanical parts in the arm and you can actually zip a jacket you can hold they've got pictures of folks holding an egg and not breaking it with a bionic arm so you know the six million dollar man really is here now and it's just it's wonderful for folks like this 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 young woman who able, was able to receive this arm and one last example the technology keeps improving for diagnosis I'm holding an ordinary iPhone but it has an app and a special case that will allow me just by pressing my fingers on this to get uh, an EKG and send this to you via email and you can treat me? Absolutely. I used it on a flight to San Francisco last week. There was a gentleman who was in respiratory distress, trouble breathing, and I used my iPhone, a live core EKG, to determine he wasn't having a heart attack and that we figured out exactly what was going on. And I was able to communicate with the pilot and we were able to, to decide about diversion of the plane appropriately. This is amazing technology that really puts so much information at the patient's fingertips and allows me as the physician to do so much better for for that patient because I have this data to use. And you have a device with you that it will be used for treating migraines? 
I do. This is the Cephaly uh, device. It has been shown in clinical trials in Belgium to decrease the amount of migraines. I'm going to put it on. You put it on your head like this. It delivers an electrical impulse to my trigeminal nerve. You do this for 20 minutes a day, every day, and it was shown in clinical trials to decrease migraines. It is now FDA approved in the United States. You need a prescription for it, but this is an amazing device. It gets people off pain medicine. It's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Next, this commentator from the National Rifle Association on why these are the good new days for people like him. Clips from a History Channel TV show where marksmen compete. Chris Chang. They shoot crossbows, rifles, grenade launchers. <laughs> Chris wins! You have earned the title of history's top shot. Chris Chang, after that show, quit his job and now he works with the NRA. He makes speeches about guns and gun culture. And yet, that almost certainly would not have happened in the good old days. Why? Yeah, I mean, you know, someone like me who's a gay Asian guy. Who You're a twofer in terms of being a discriminated against group. Asians were less harshly discriminated against, but you have relatives who were locked up during World War II. Yep, you know, the, I'm half Japanese, and so you know, part, some of my family members were interned uh, in internment camps during World War II, but obviously, you know, things are much better for, for Asian Americans now. But the one that really sets off often macho men, and I associate that with the NRA, uh, is your being gay. Mm -hmm. And on the show, you didn't say I'm gay. My competitors didn't care. They, they thought, knew. They knew. And what was interesting is that the History Channel never outed me because they told me it just never became an issue. And for me, that was a really, really cool moment where my own stereotypes that I had brought into the gun community were just shattered. Life has come a long way from 17 years ago when Ellen DeGeneres said this on her sitcom. Why can't I just say the truth? I mean, be who I am. I'm 35 years old. I'm so afraid to tell people. I mean, I just... Susan, I'm gay. Her studio audience applauded, but America did not. Advertising agency reports Chrysler, J.C. Penney, dropped commercials from her show. Her ratings took a dive. The show was canceled. Ellen was unemployed for several years and reportedly came close to bankruptcy. But just 15 years later, she's hired as J.C. Penney's spokeswoman. And she's hosted the Academy Awards twice. I mean, this is so quick. Yeah, it's been amazing to see the tide shift in American culture and the change of opinion that, you know, nowadays there's so much more support for gay rights, for same-sex marriage and equality. And All right, well, same-sex marriage is yet a different point, and well, let's look how quickly attitudes changed there. In 2004, an ABC Washington Post poll found gay marriage was opposed by 59% of Americans just 10 years later, supported by 59%. It's just been amazing to see so many out and, and proud you know, gay Americans like Ellen, like uh, Anderson Cooper, and uh, Neil Patrick Harris, and now with Michael Sam being you know, the first openly gay NFL so player. There were a lot of people who were very upset by that. Uh, one f football player, Derek Ward, tweeted, man, you got little kids looking at the draft when the kiss was played. If it's going to be okay for the media to show opposite, you know, heterosexual couples, you know, kissing and being affectionate, then why shouldn't it also be okay to have same-sex couples doing the same thing? Let's move from uh, sexual orientation to women. The good old days were definitely not great for most women. Nancy Pelosi understood that when she became the first female Speaker of the House. It is a moment for which we have waited over 200 years. And today we have broken the marble ceiling. 
marble ceiling. Um, great. But somehow, just a few years later, liberal women are screaming about how terrible life is for women. We start with Sandra Fluck. Too many women are shut out and silenced. Right up until now, being a woman is a pre-existing medical condition. We really are so far from equality in this industry. Women are not making it to the top of any profession. Women are not making it to the top of professions. You worked in Silicon Valley. What's your experience? Well, you know, if we, if we look at people like Sheryl Sandberg, who we just saw, who's the chief operating officer of Facebook, and Marissa Mayer, who's the CEO of, of Yahoo, you know, things continue to change, and they're changing very quickly. Female execs run HP, IBM, PepsiCo, Xerox, Avon products, and yet this victimhood culture is still out there among women? achieving women? Well, you know, I mean, the whole victim mentality, to me, it, it's a choice to be made. When, you know, someone is uh, hurling anti-gay or racial epithets at me, it's a matter of what do I do with this information? How do I take that energy and translate that into something positive? Uh, on one quick example, with Asian Americans in, in uh, you know, executive leadership, there are not many Asian Americans in CEO because of discrimination. There's other cultural factors that are affecting, um, uh, you know, the affecting Asian Americans' ability to rise through the ranks of corporate America. But again, we're not going to play the victim card here and say that. Oh, good, no more victim cards. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. We do tend to forget how different America was just recently. It's not just that gays couldn't get security clearances. Women weren't allowed to vote. Just 40 years ago, women couldn't get a credit card without their husband's permission. The good old days were not so good for women or blacks. When I was born, black people couldn't legally marry a white person or attend the same schools or eat at the same lunch counter. Now we have a black president, and he's still my president, even though he's wrong about most everything. This was the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. I do think at a certain point you've made enough money. If you got a business, that, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. When we return, how he and Bill O'Reilly are wrong about the future, which is good news, with one exception. There is some bad news. Our nation is in decline. So says the curmudgeon in chief of Fox News. But I say, Bill, give me a break on almost all fronts. These are the good new days. And tonight's show highlights why life should keep getting better, except for one big problem, politicians. Politicians who have the power to spend other people's money. They can destroy our future, and they are on the road to doing that. This is federal spending per person since America began. It started low, less than 5% of the economy. Here's World War I. Here's World War II. It used to go down after wars, but now, even in peacetime, it only goes up. Pretty soon, we're up here. How are we going to pay for that? We can't pay for it. Even if we doubled tax rates, tripled them, America couldn't afford to pay for the Medicare, Social Security, and other new spending politicians have promised us. At the start of this show, I made fun of some media scaremongers, and it was probably unfair to include sound bites like these. We're talking about the destruction of our society. Another depression. Everything comes to a grinding halt. Programs lose funding. Social Security checks go unpaid. Employers can't meet payrolls and one day the system breaks. Those warnings make sense because they were talking about our debt. That's a real problem, unlike most of the others we talked about tonight. We are going broke, and the response of our politicians is not to cut anything. It's to double down on idiotic policies that will increase our debt. This clueless ex-congressman once bragged he was responsible for allowing you to buy a home if you put down a measly $1,000 down payment. So is he now an outcast? No, now the president has appointed him head of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. This month, Melvin Watt announced Fannie and Freddie will dump the few 
prudent rules they imposed after the last housing bubble. And once again, taxpayers will guarantee your mortgage if you just put down a small down payment. It creates what economists call moral hazard. It invites us to behave badly. And when we do, they reward us with taxpayer money. Our politicians are the biggest threat to our future. But let's not end on that dour note. Despite our irresponsible politicians, life has gotten better. Silicon Valley keeps inventing things faster than government can crush them. Google will inform us about most anything within seconds. And it's free. It's free all around the world. People in the poorest countries now have access to more information than the rich used to have. Airbnb lets us share homes. Uber and Lyft let us share our cars. Eatwith.com let us, lets us share a home-cooked meal. Facebook allows us to share all kinds of things. So does email. And it's all free. Skype is free. It lets you chat with anyone anywhere in the world. Here's students at a school in Brazil Skype with old people in America. We created a tool that connects our students with seniors in the USA living in retirement homes. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. The students learn English and the elderly are less lonely. I'm good, how are you? And again, it's all free. These innovations happen because they happened before politicians could crush them. They're part of what Adam Thierer calls permissionless innovation. We didn't have to get approval from Washington to do Google searches, Facebook profiles, create apps for Apple. If we did, they probably would never have happened. If innovators can just keep creating new things faster than politicians and regulators can kill them, our future will indeed be the good new days. That's our show. See you next week.